So thank you so much for having me. It's been such a great event, as many of you have said, and so nice to meet so many people from all around the world. Uh, so what I'm speaking about is, as, as Rosemary mentioned, ASIC enforcement. And this, for me, was a very long-range project, which is still ongoing. Um, it started as an empirical project where I'm basically looking at 20 years worth of data. And so those data sets haven't been fully completed, but as a working project, I thought what a great place to seek some feedback on that and and kind of see, you know, or or kind of say where I've gotten to so far. Uh, so in, in terms of what I'm looking at, it's it's been, you know, the theories behind some of the changes to the laws, the ASIC enforcement priorities and how they enforce it from a law in action perspective. So I've I've kind of been looking at it, not so much what are the regulations on the books, but saying how we see this in practice. And so when I set out to do this, it started as a smaller project, but then I've received quite a lot of encouragement to kind of take it further. And people have said, well, we haven't seen what this actually looks like. And so for me, that was, was very interesting and exciting to do. So I focused on in-court enforcement in particular, uh, this is because in Australia, it's easier to get full and complete data sets of this. And so it allowed me to, I guess, do more rigorous um, work from an empirical perspective. And in so doing, even though I started out looking at public enforcement or ASIC enforcement, uh, it was interesting that within the data sets, a lot of private enforcement came up. So I expanded then to look at both public and private enforcement. And I was shocked and those that I worked with in, in you know, when I started as, as a master's and DPhil student went on to do my PhD, were also saying, How's not, how hasn't anyone spoken about this? So it became really almost a little bit of, of digging down and really finding out what's going on here. Um, so just to give the background you know, to the international context of this, so I, I'm looking at director's duty and disclosure law enforcement, which exists obviously in some form or another across jurisdictions. Uh, but in terms of from an ASIC perspective, because we're all from such different backgrounds, I just thought I'd briefly say that ASIC is Australia's public regulator, uh, an independent federal government body, which was created by the ASIC Act 2001 one and primarily administers and enforces the corporation's legislation, hence the go-to for looking at director's duty enforcement and mandatory disclosure law enforcement as well. Um, and when I started out looking at this, another thing you know that we see through ASIC's communication, they expressly state that they are less likely to investigate matters that would be better addressed by private enforcement mechanisms. So an interesting aspect of of I think the Australian framework here is that from a policy perspective, they view their role as, as complementary to that of private enforcement, at least in, in these communications that have been set out. Um, and I think that, that that's interesting for us to, to look at as well. Um, in terms of the Australian context of this as well, I thought I just, because we're all from such different jurisdictions, I thought it'd be interesting to say, well, why Australia? Why look at Australia in, in this project? Um, I think I've done so because even having worked overseas, Australia is obviously an economically significant jurisdiction. Uh, it is underrepresented in current literature. So being a corporate law person overseas, you know, I'm often the only one at the table speaking about Australia. And I, th I think it's interesting to bring that uh, perspective as well. Um, just, you know, in terms of stock market capitalization as a ratio to GDP, um, we're comparable both to the UK UK and to Japan, and a lot of people don't realize that. So we are um, economically significant, um, you know, looking at it on that on that kind of per capita basis. Um, and and you know, we have seen increasing levels of institutional shareholder concentration, as has also occurred within both the UK and the US. I think also Australia is interesting to examine, you know, given the distinctive combination of both public and private enforcement, as I mentioned, which I think around international tables, people tend to think that's quite interesting that we have, you know, both public and private enforcement available, uh, particularly, I think, in relation to directors duties and mandatory disclosure laws, hence my focus on that. So previous studies have noted, um, and those that are from Australia know this, the very high levels of formal public enforcement that appear to exist in Australia. 
as well as the fact that Australia now appears to be the key jurisdiction outside of the US in which a corporation is most likely to be subject to a securities class action, which I think is, is interesting. So I think Australia really has an interesting combination of factors, including strong investigation and public enforcement powers, um, increasingly utilized private enforcement powers, a federal system of regulation and enforcement, and a high level of public enforcement intensity. So the amalgamation of these elements, I think, you know, when I've spoken, it seems to be quite internationally distinctive, I think, particularly in the areas that I look at. So that's, I think, leading into this project, um, what, what led me to, to dig down into this. So I think given the very limited amount of time, I might just go into, I think it would be interesting to look at some of the findings thus far. And then that takes me to the short history, I think, similar to your presentation. It's a short history on this, looking at around about 20 years. To, to kind of once I've looked at what do we see, the interesting questions are why do we see it and what is the history here in terms of the policy dialogues. Um, so I, I, the first thing that I argue in, in this project is that a dual modality approach to enforcement should be taken. So that is to say we must look at both public and private enforcement and it's really important to do so given that context within Australia that we see where both of these things are available. And as I said, most people were like, well, surely someone's done that, but no, nobody has as <laughs> thus far. Um, and, and just in relation to our, our case frequency within the data set, uh, once again, this is not, you know, I don't have my complete data sets, but this is over around about 13 year period thus far. Um, so there were within the data set around about one point to be super specific, 1.6 director's duty cases per year in the data set within publicly listed companies over the study period. Uh, whereas if you look at the number of publicly listed companies in Australia re represented in the data set, so 13% of the cases were in um, publicly listed companies versus private companies. So this, this far exceeded the proportionate representation of listed companies compared with total registered companies within the Australian market. Um, yeah, so compared with total registered companies, obviously, this less than 1% that you see, less than 1% publicly listed companies. Um, and indeed, if you look at the, the probabilities that I was able to calculate for whatever you know this means to people, it's, the research indicates that there's a 0.08% probability that a publicly listed company in, will have one of its directors named a defendant. And I think you can look at this a little bit comparatively. So this figure can be contrasted with the comparable probability in the UK, which John Armour and his team reported as indistinguishable from zero. I mean, sure, 0 0.08 isn't large, but we thought setting out on this project that th this would be more similar with the UK. In, in fact, it appears to be more similar to the US. So this was somewhat of a surprise, I think. And um, regarding the frequency of privately enforced uh, disclosure cases, there are five cases filed per year in the data set over the study period, which indicates a 0.04% probability that a publicly listed company will have um, one of its directors named a defendant in a filed case in this area. And this exceeds, you know, the private enforcement intensity found in the UK, which previous research indicates is close to zero. And it is likewise appearing to be much more similar to the US, which is an interesting finding once again. Uh, so another thing that came out of, of the enforcement results here were that we could look at enforcement modality and company type. So the director's duty case study results indicated that there was a statistically significant relationship between the modality of enforcement we saw and the company type. So that is to say that public enforcement was more likely to occur within publicly listed companies. And I, I won't have time to go into it in a, in a lot of detail, but um, a lot of asset communications or policy documents say the same thing, that they, they seek high profile cases and they seek to really, you know, put into the public scene or the media that if something has been done, they want to, you know, they want to call it out. So I think this was supported by the results. Um, and, and then likewise, private enforcement was more commonly observed within private companies. And perhaps, um, perhaps surprisingly, in the disclosure law context, sorry, in the in the class action context, everyone, so that is to say 100% of the cases in the data set were supported by commercial litigation funding agreements. Um, and, and once again, you know, I think prior to this, this research project starting, which it did uh, quite a long time ago, um, this wasn't seen as, as, as being the case, it wasn't 100% that you would see uh, found, were underwritten by these funding agreements. 
Um, and then when we looked at the settled cases, the net settlement amount was tiny compared with investor losses. And, and that was something also, I think you see in the US context, I think once again, I don't have time to go into it today, but this leads to the theoretical uh, a question or you know, to, to the normative a question as to whether that is a sensible priority for these class actions. Do we, do we think they should compensate for all investor losses? Is that possible? Should that be the case? But I won't have time to discuss that too much. Um, and given the time limitations, I think regarding the substantive claim made, we saw that there were links between the type of enforcement and the type of director's duty claim that was brought. Uh, and likewise, in respect of the parties targeted by actions, um, we could we could determine some correlations between the ASIC uh, targeting of enforcement actions, whether this was against the company, the directors, or both. Likewise, in the private enforcement context, we were able to uncover similar correlations. Once again, given the time constraints, this is a huge project. We'd like to talk about this for hours. But anyway, uh, go going down to that, it was interesting just to see those correlations existing as well. Um, then we went to the theoretical, or then I went to the theoretical side of things, and, and then in looking at the question as to why do we see what we see, it was interesting to then go back through this 20 years, and um, the three theories that I think underpin some of the results uh, viewed are, are the shareholder dispersion theory, so that is to say, depending on the dispersion of, of shareholders within the company, you, you tend to see different types of enforcement actions being brought, um, depending on concentration, depending on level of institutional shareholders present. This was something that I think is, is underpinning some of these results. Um, the substitution theory, that is to say that uh, something I came up with was that sometimes you see different types of enforcement substitute for one another. So if we don't have public enforcement, maybe we have private enforcers step in. Or likewise, if a private enforcer hasn't done a good job, maybe ASIC also takes that on. Um, whereas I think, you know, as, as a lot of the talks we've heard today, this is more nuanced than what is reported. You know, you see reports about, oh, well, why do we have overlapping actions? And it's not, you know, you have to look at look down into the depths of that data to see what do those overlapping actions achieve. And it's not always a negative thing to have that um, because as I, as I mentioned, sometimes different parties are actually targeted in by these actions. Um, and, and then once again, we also look, I also looked at these this remedy information, which I won't have time to go into too much. Uh, and the last theory was the publicity theory was that I advanced that, you know, you are you are going to tend to see some enforcement decisions made upon the basis of sending a message to the investing public. So that is to say, we want to target high profile directors, high profile cases in order that these things are publicized and perhaps this will have a deterrent effect arising from that. Uh, I think, you know, given the, how am I up to now too? Is it two? Okay, yeah. Per no, yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I think um, from uh, the historical perspective, it was interesting then to look back, I can briefly state this, I think in the remaining time, look back over the history of the enforcement policies to kind of say, why isn't this so much discussed? And um, there's a lot. So I went through 20 years worth of, of you know, regulator dialogues, policy dialogues, legislator dialogues here. Um, and, and I think that, you know, I don't know why it hasn't been discussed, but it is, you know, if we look at, for example, Australia's most significant government inquiry into the performance of ASIC, if you look at this, it scarcely mentions the interaction between public and private enforcement, particularly in the disclosure law context in Australia. And the final parliamentary report here, I went through like painstakingly the whole thing. It report draws briefly upon Australian case law and US SEC commentary of all things in assuming that private enforcement complements public enforcement and assists in the achievement of, for example, compensation and deterrence aims. But, you know, it's not mentioned any more than this. We have an SEC document. Then we look at the director's duty context. Uh, the 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 contribution of private enforcement is not mentioned at all anywhere in that report. Nowhere. And so I thought, wow, like you know, we understand in Australia we have complementary forms of enforcement, but yet we're we're viewing these in their own separate baskets. Like some people look at private enforcement, some people look at public enforcement, some people look at one specific director's duty, some people look at something, you know, just class actions. But we've not put this data together to get a more holistic understanding of are we actually achieving the aims we've set out to achieve here. Um, similar in their final report of the financial system inquiry, the committee recommended um, 
increasing. They said, let's increase maximum civil and criminal penalties because everyone's saying there's deficiencies in our enforcement. But once again, you know, my research, and I, I think I'm done now, I'm thinking I'm out of time, but my <laughs> research shows there's a much more nuanced understanding to be had here. Sometimes we have a small penalty, but you can have a deterrent impact come from the publicity of that penalty, or you can have a private enforcer come in and there will be some compensation sought, and that will achieve different aims, but we're just not seeing this brought together in any holistic theory-based way. So I think for me, I'm excited just to continue this and to try and make this discussion a little bit more complete in bringing just some important, you know, not super complex data, but bringing them all together to kind of say, what do we see across a 20 year period, across both types of enforcement, and then let's have a more nuanced, reasonable, evidence-based discussion about what effective enforcement looks like in Australia. So thank you.